Winesburg, Ohio, by Sherwood Anderson. Mother, concerning Elizabeth Willard. Elizabeth Willard, the mother of George Willard, was tall and gaunt, and her face was marked with smallpox scars. Although she was but forty-five, some obscure disease had taken the fire out of her figure. Listlessly, she went about the disorderly old hotel, looking at the faded wallpaper and the ragged carpets, and, when she was able to be about, doing the work of a chambermaid among beds soiled by the slumbers of fat traveling men. Her husband, Tom Willard, a slender, graceful man with square shoulders, a quick military step, and a black mustache trained to turn sharply up at the ends, tried to put the wife out of his mind. The presence of the tall, ghostly figure moving slowly through the halls he took as a reproach to himself. When he thought of her, he grew angry and swore. The hotel was unprofitable and forever on the edge of failure, and he wished himself out of it. He thought of the old house and the woman who lived there with him as things defeated and done for. The hotel in which he had begun life so hopefully was now a mere ghost of what a hotel should be. As he went spruce and businesslike through the streets of Winesburg, he sometimes stopped and turned quickly about as though fearing that the spirit of the hotel and of the woman would follow him even into the streets. Damn such a life! Damn it! he sputtered aimlessly. Tom Willard had a passion for village politics and for years had been the leading Democrat in a strongly Republican community. Some day, he told himself, the tide of things political will turn in my favor and the years of ineffectual service count big in the bestowal of rewards. He dreamed of going to Congress and even of becoming governor. Once, when a younger member of the party arose at a political conference and began to boast of his faithful service, Tom Willard grew white with fury. "'Shut up, you!' he roared, glaring about. "'What do you know of service? What are you but a boy? Look at what I've done here. I was a Democrat here in Winesburg when it was a crime to be a Democrat. In the old days they fairly hunted us with guns.' Between Elizabeth and her one son, George, there was a deep, unexpressed bond of sympathy based on a girlhood dream that had long ago died. In the son's presence, she was timid and reserved. But sometimes, while he hurried about town intent upon his duties as a reporter, she went into his room and, closing the door, knelt by a little desk made of a kitchen table that sat near a window. In the room, by the desk, she went through a ceremony that was half a prayer— half a demand, addressed to the skies. In the boyish figure, she yearned to see something half-forgotten that had once been a part of herself recreated. The prayer concerned that. Even though I die, I will in some way keep defeat from you, she cried, and so deep was her determination that her whole body shook. Her eyes glowed, and she clenched her fists, "'If I am dead and see him becoming a meaningless drab figure like myself, I will come back,' she declared. "'I ask God now to give me that privilege. I demand it. I will pay for it. God may beat me with his fists. I will take any blow that may befall it, if but my boy be allowed to express something for us both.' Pausing uncertainly, the woman stared about the boy's room. "'And do not let him become smart and successful either,' she added vaguely. The communion between George Willard and his mother was outwardly a formal thing without meaning. When she was ill and sat by the window in her room, he sometimes went in the evening to make her a visit. They sat by a window that looked over the roof of a small frame building into Main Street. By turning their heads, they could see through another window along an alleyway that ran behind the Main Street stores and into the back door of Abner Groff's bakery. Sometimes, as they sat thus, a picture of village life presented itself to them. At the back door of his shop appeared Abner Groff with a stick or an empty milk bottle in his hand. For a long time there was a feud between the baker and a gray cat that belonged to Sylvester West, the druggist. The boy and his mother saw the cat creep into the door of the bakery and presently emerge, followed by the baker, who swore and waved his arms about. The baker's eyes were small and red, and his black hair and beard were filled with flour dust. Sometimes he was so angry that, although the cat had disappeared— he hurled sticks, bits of broken glass, and even some of the tools of his trade about. Once he broke a window at the back of Sinning's hardware store. In the alley the gray cat crouched behind barrels filled with torn paper and broken bottles, above which flew a black swarm of flies. 
once when she was alone, and after watching a prolonged and ineffectual outburst on the part of the baker, Elizabeth Willard put her head down on her long white hands and wept. After that, she did not look along the alleyway any more, but tried to forget the contest between the bearded man and the cat. It seemed like a rehearsal of her own life, terrible in its vividness. In the evening, when the son sat in the room with his mother, the silence made them both feel awkward. Darkness came on, and the evening train came in at the station. In the street below, feet tramped up and down upon a board sidewalk. In the station yard, after the evening train had gone, there was a heavy silence. Perhaps Skinner Leeson, the express agent, moved a truck the length of the station platform. Over on Main Street sounded a man's voice, laughing. The door of the express office banged. George Willard arose, and crossing the room, fumbled for the doorknob. Sometimes he knocked against a chair, making it scrape along the floor. By the window sat the sick woman, perfectly still, listless. Her long hands, white and bloodless, could be seen drooping over the ends of the arms of the chair. "'I think you had better be out among the boys. You are too much indoors,' she said, striving to relieve the embarrassment of the departure. "'I thought I would take a walk,' replied George Willard, who felt awkward and confused. One evening in July, when the transient guest who made the new Willard house their temporary home had become scarce, and the hallways, lighted only by kerosene lamps turned low, were plunged in gloom, Elizabeth Willard had an adventure. She had been ill in bed for several days, and her son had not come to visit her. She was alarmed. The feeble blaze of life that remained in her body was blown into a flame by her anxiety, and she crept out of bed, dressed, and hurried along the hallway toward her son's room, shaking with exaggerated fears. As she went along, she steadied herself with her hand, slipped along the papered walls of the hall, and breathed with difficulty. The air whistled through her teeth. As she hurried forward, she thought how foolish she was. He is concerned with boyish affairs, she told herself. Perhaps he has now begun to walk about in the evening with girls. Elizabeth Willard had a dread of being seen by guests in the hotel that had once belonged to her father, and the ownership of which still stood recorded in her name in the county courthouse. The hotel was continually losing patronage because of its shabbiness, and she thought of herself as also shabby. Her own room was in an obscure corner, and when she felt able to work, she voluntarily worked among the beds, preferring the labor that could be done when the guests were abroad seeking trade among the merchants of Winesburg. By the door of her son's room, the mother knelt upon the floor and listened for some sound from within. When she heard the boy moving about, and talking in low tones, a smile came to her lips. George Willard had a habit of talking aloud to himself, and to hear him doing so had always given his mother a peculiar pleasure. The habit in him, she felt, strengthened the secret bond that existed between them. A thousand times she had whispered to herself of the matter. "'He is groping about,' "'Trying to find himself,' she thought. "'He is not a dull clod, all words and smartness. "'Within him there is a secret something that is striving to grow. "'It is the thing I let be killed in myself.' "'In the darkness in the hallway, by the door, "'the sick woman arose and started again toward her own room. "'She was afraid that the door would open and the boy come upon her. "'When she had reached a safe distance and was about to turn a corner "'into a second hallway, she stopped.' and bracing herself with her hands, waited, thinking to shake off a trembling fit of weakness that had come upon her. The presence of the boy in the room had made her happy. In her bed, during the long hours alone, the little fears that had visited her had become giants. Now they were all gone. "'When I get back to my room, I shall sleep,' she murmured gratefully. But Elizabeth Willard was not to return to her bed and to sleep. As she stood trembling in the darkness, the door of her son's room opened, and the boy's father, Tom Willard, stepped out. In the light that streamed out at the door, he stood with the knob in his hand and talked. What he said infuriated the woman. Tom Willard was ambitious for his son. He had always thought of himself as a successful man, although nothing he had ever done had turned out successfully. However, when he was out of sight of the new Willard house and had no fear of coming upon his wife— he swaggered and began to dramatize himself as one of the chief men of the town. He wanted his son to succeed. He it was who had secured for the boy the position on the Winesburg Eagle. Now, with a ring of earnestness in his voice, he was advising concerning some course of conduct. "'I'll tell you what, George, you've got to wake up,' 
he said sharply. "'Will Henderson has spoken to me three times concerning the matter. "'He says you go along for hours not hearing when you are spoken to "'and acting like a gawky girl. What ails you?' "'Tom Willard laughed good-naturedly. "'Well, I guess you'll get over it,' he said. "'I told Will that. "'You're not a fool, and you're not a woman. "'You're Tom Willard's son, and you'll wake up. "'I'm not afraid. "'What you say clears things up.' If being a newspaper man had put the notion of becoming a writer into your mind, that's all right. Only, I guess you'll have to wake up to do that, too, huh? Tom Willard went briskly along the hallway and down a flight of stairs to the office. The woman in the darkness could hear him laughing and talking with a guest who was striving to wear away a dull evening by dosing in a chair by the office door. She returned to the door of her son's room. The weakness had passed from her body as by a miracle, and she stepped boldly along. A thousand ideas raced through her head when she heard the scraping of a chair and the sound of a pen scratching upon paper. She again turned and went back along the hallway to her own room. A definite determination had come into the mind of the defeated wife of the Winesburg hotel keeper. The determination was the result of long years of quiet and rather ineffectual thinking. Now, she told herself, I will act. There is something threatening my boy and I will ward it off. The fact that the conversation between Tom Willard and his son had been rather quiet and natural, as though an understanding existed between them, maddened her. Although for years she had hated her husband, her hatred had always before been a quite impersonal thing. He had been merely a part of something else that she hated. Now, and by the few words at the door, he had become the thing personified. In the darkness of her own room, she clenched her fists and glared about. Going to a cloth bag that hung on a nail by the wall, she took out a long pair of sewing scissors and held them in her hand like a dagger. "'I will stab him,' she said aloud. "'He has chosen to be the voice of evil, and I will kill him. When I have killed him, something will snap within myself, and I will die also. It will be a release for all of us.' In her girlhood, and before her marriage with Tom Willard, Elizabeth had borne a somewhat shaky reputation in Winesburg. For years she had been what is called stage-struck, and had paraded through the streets with traveling men guests at her father's hotel, wearing loud clothes and urging them to tell her of life in the cities out of which they had come. Once she startled the town by putting on men's clothes and riding a bicycle down Main Street. In her own mind, the tall, dark girl had been in those days much confused— a great restlessness was in her, and it expressed itself in two ways. First, there was an uneasy desire for change, for some big, definite movement to her life. It was this feeling that had turned her mind to the stage. She dreamed of joining some company and wandering over the world, seeing always new faces and giving something out of herself to all people. Sometimes, at night, she was quite beside herself with the thought— but when she tried to talk of the matter to the members of the theatrical companies that came to Winesburg and stopped at her father's hotel, she got nowhere. They did not seem to know what she meant, or, if she did get something of her passion expressed, they only laughed. "'It's not like that,' they said. "'It's as dull and uninteresting as this here. Nothing comes of it.' With the traveling men, when she walked about with them, and later with Tom Willard, it was quite different." Always they seemed to understand and sympathize with her. On the side streets of the village, in the darkness under the trees, they took hold of her hand, and she thought that something unexpressed in herself came forth and became a part of an unexpressed something in them. And then there was the second expression of her restlessness. When that came, she felt for a time released and happy. She did not blame the men who walked with her, and later she did not blame Tom Willard. It was always the same, beginning with kisses— and ending after strange, wild emotions, with peace, and then sobbing repentance. When she sobbed, she put her hand upon the face of the man, and had always the same thought. Even though he were large and bearded, she thought he had become suddenly a little boy. She wondered why he did not sob also. In her room, tucked away in a corner of the old Willard house, Elizabeth Willard lighted a lamp and put it on a dressing table that stood by the door. A thought had come into her mind, and she went to a closet and brought out a small square box and set it on the table. The box contained material for makeup and had been left with other things by a theatrical company that had once been stranded in Winesburg. Elizabeth Willard had decided that she would be beautiful. 
Her hair was still black, and there was a great mass of it braided and coiled about her head. The scene in the office below began to grow in her mind. No ghostly worn-out figure should confront Tom Willard, but something quite unexpected and startling. Tall, and with dusky cheeks and hair that fell in a mass from her shoulders, a figure should come striding down the stairway before the startled loungers in the hotel office. The figure would be silent. It would be swift and terrible. As a tigress whose cub had been threatened, would she appear, coming out of the shadows, stealing noiselessly along, and holding the long, wicked scissors in her hand. With a little broken sob in her throat, Elizabeth Willard blew out the light that stood upon the table, and stood weak and trembling in the darkness. The strength that had been as a miracle in her body left, and she half reeled across the floor, clutching at the back of the chair in which she had spent so many long days, staring out over the tin roofs into the main street of Winesburg. In the hallway there was the sound of footsteps, and George Willard came in at the door. Sitting in a chair beside his mother, he began to talk. "'I'm going to get out of here,' he said. "'I don't know where I shall go or what I shall do, but I am going away.' The woman in the chair waited and trembled. An impulse came to her. "'I suppose you had better wake up,' she said. "'You think that? You will go to the city and make money, eh? It will be better for you, you think, to be a businessman, to be brisk and smart and alive?' She waited and trembled. The son shook his head. "'I suppose I can't make you understand, but, oh, oh, I wish I could,' he said earnestly. "'I can't even try to talk to father about it. I don't try. There isn't any use. I don't know what I shall do. I just want to go away and look at people and think.' Silence fell upon the room where the boy and woman sat together. Again, as on the other evenings, they were embarrassed. After a time the boy tried again to talk. "'I suppose it won't be for a year or two, but I've been thinking about it,' he said, rising and going toward the door. "'Something father said makes it sure that I shall have to go away.' He fumbled with the doorknob. In the room the silence became unbearable to the woman. She wanted to cry out with joy because of the words that had come from the lips of her son, but the expression of joy had become impossible to her. "'I think you had better go out among the boys. "'You are too much indoors,' she said. "'I thought I would go for a little walk,' replied the son, "'stepping awkwardly out of the room and closing the door. "'The End of Mother Concerning Elizabeth Willard "'Read by Rick Kistner for Lit to Go "'On the web at fcit.usf.edu.'